Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Paige. I'm a programming librarian here at Saskatoon Public Library. Uh, welcome to Sustainability Speaker Series, and thank you for coming out today. Uh, we have some tea and water in the back, so please help yourself to that. Uh, we are gathered today on Treaty 6 territory in the homelands of the Métis. On behalf of the Saskatoon Public Library, we pay respect to the Indigenous ancestors of this place. As an organization that played an important role in the settlement of Saskatoon, and as a key memory institution, we acknowledge our responsibility to respond in meaningful ways to the calls to action. Um, I'd like to invite Sri Sabani to say some brief words on behalf of the Friends of the Saskatoon Afforestation Areas. Hi, good evening everyone, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Engineer Sri Chan Sobani, and I'm speaking on behalf of Friends of Saskatoon Afforestation Area here. As we gather today, I would like to acknowledge National Forest Week running from 22nd of uh, sep sep September to 28th of September 2024. And uh, this year's theme is Two Eyed Seeing, which is welcoming all knowledge to sustain our forests. Highlighting the importance of and embracing the diverse perspectives in our con uh, conservation efforts. We are privileged to protect our two man-made forests in prairies, which began as tree nurseries in 1972 and 1973 under the City of Saskatoon's Green Survival Program. These spaces flourished into vital green areas for our community. The city's investment into the vital green areas for our community, the city's investment has gone into the national infrastructure funds, is both timely and it is appreciated. Especially after our team installed the protective fencing in the Richard St. Barbaker Afforestation area, and we would like to also thanks to Government of Canada for their timely grants. In addition to that, we continue our efforts to safeguard the 148-acre uh, George and Roo Urban Park, Regional Park. George and Roo, an Olympic gold medalist, is an inspiring part of Saskatoon's legacy. <coughs> Meanwhile, Richard St. Barbaker, often recognized as the world's first global conservationist, has deep roots in this city too. We are also thrilled to welcome Dr. Eric Lamb, uh, who will offer us insights into cutting edge ec ecological restoration practices. This is wonderful opportunity for us to reflect and learn and act on behalf of our, our urban green spaces and the forest pres preserving them for the future generations. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude to Saskatchewan Environmental Society for their uh, organizing the sustainability speaker series. And also I would like to show my gratitude to Saskatoon Public Library for their continued support on these kind of events. Thank you all. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you so much. Um, the program tonight can only happen because of the partnership the library has with the Saskatoon Environmental Society, who work hard to find knowledgeable speakers month after month. I'd like to invite Judy Montgomery from the Sask Saskatchewan Environmental Society to come up and introduce our tonight's presenter. Good evening. Welcome to the Saskatchewan Environmental Society Sustainable Speaker Series. My name is Judy Montgomery, and I'm a member of SES and a volunteer with the Sustainable Speaker Series. How many of you are members of SES? Good. Well, any more who are interested after tonight, we have some uh, brochures at the back to look at and uh, sign up if you'd like to join us. And how many of you have come to the series before? Good. This is a monthly series 
we uh, have some great speakers coming up. October 22nd will be the next speaker, and uh, I'll tell you more about that later. There's also a sign-up sheet at the back to sign up if you'd like to be notified about upcoming uh, series. So just if you want to put your name on that, we can give a few an email or text message before the event. The Saskatchewan Environmental Society is a non-profit registered charity committed to supporting sustainable living and sustainable resource use in Saskatchewan. We work with and on behalf of communities, organizations, businesses, and policymakers to encourage informed decision making that moves us towards sustainability. SES's current action areas include sustainable energy and climate solutions, water protection, resource conservation, biodiversity present, preservation, and reduction of toxic substances. Our work in Saskatchewan is carried out in Treaties 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 10. And our office is in, the Sa in Saskatoon on Treaty 6, the homeland of the, or the traditional territory of Cree people and the homeland of the Métis Nation. You can find out more about SES Good Works on our website at www.environmentalsociety.ca. Thank you, Srihan, for your introduction to Afforestation Saskatoon. Our main speaker tonight is Dr. Eric Lamb. He's a professor at the University of Saskatchewan in the Department of Plant Sciences at the College of Agriculture and Bioresources. He is also the curator of the herbarium at the University of Saskatchewan. He has studied grasslands, and its res research areas include plant ecology, and fire ecology. He has a PhD in biological sciences from the University of Alberta. Tonight's presentation is Get this, These Species Out of My Lawn, Invasive Grasses, Biodiversity, and Grassland Restoration. Dr. Lam. There you go. Oh, great. Thank you very much for that um, introduction and the uh, great words about the really good work that the Saskatchewan Environmental Society does. So my goal here is to talk a little bit about something that is one of the biggest conservation challenges we currently have in the grasslands of um, Southern Saskatchewan and Alberta, um, invasive grasses. And I also want to talk a, um, I want to talk a little bit about the science underlying why that's a problem. So I'm going to try and be at, um, I'm going to try and dive into a fair amount of, a certain amount of detail, the science behind what, why, or why we know what we know. So I think it's important to understand the process we get to, to um, when we need, want to understand something. So, yeah. Can't get them out of there. Yeah. Invasive process are yeah. Can't, can't get to the next slide here. <laughs> Probably I'm too far away from the uh, little antenna up there. So, it's working from the back. <laughs> um, let's see. failure, at which point we just continue 
until the uh, tech issues resolve themselves. Yes. So the next slide we would be looking at here would be um, just be acknowledging the numbers of people who contributed to the work I'm going to be talking about. Uh, because when I'm up here talking, I'm talking about research that is the result of hard work of numerous master's students, PhD students, postdocs, uh, and then the undergrads who do the really hard work of um, when when things things need to be need to be done. Um, so so there will be a time there acknowledging in particular Candace Piper, Jen Bell, Steve Mamet, who were all trainees within um, my program at various times, and then a uh, very close colleague of mine, Stephen Siciliano, who's a soil microbiologist. So. The species we're worried about here. There's two of them, Kentucky bluegrass and smooth brown. Now, Kentucky bluegrass, you've probably, you probably saw it many times today. It's a very, very common species in lawns. It's also really widely invasive in grasslands. In many places across, uh, across the Dakotas, it's taken over up to 60% of um, formerly native grassland sites. It's um, a species that likely first was introduced in the 1600s from, uh, from Eurasia. Probably came over and we got to the first horses and cattle that were brought, um, brought, to, uh, brought to North America. So, so it's been around a long time and spread, spreading widely. The second species is smooth brome which is again the Eurasian species, which was brought to North America in the 1880s as a forage grass. And particularly up through the 1920s, there was really a uh, strong effort to breed new varieties of uh, the smooth brome for hay crops. And the, uh, this species, particularly in the 1930s, was seeded in probably every roadside ditch and road allowance in Saskatchewan. Um, excellent, looks like we're back up here, perfect. So these are the people I'm acknowledging, awesome colleagues, all of them, and of course, the, all the organizations that pay for all the work. So it is a smooth brome, widely planted through the 1930s, uh, and it's a really aggressive uh, growth. This is my student, Candace Piper, sitting in the middle of a smooth brown patch. You can barely see her. Um, it's so tall. And this species has severe effects on native grass on biodiversity. Again, Kentucky bluegrass. This one, its claim to fame is it produces really, really thick litter layers. So how many here you have to have had to dethatch your lawn? Yeah, familiar with doing that? Okay, so imagine several years of that thatch build up across the quarter section. That's the, that's the kind of thing that Kentucky bluegrass will do if it's unchecked. And again, severe problems for, uh, for the grassland. So how do these grasses invade and what are their consequences? So the invasion process is pretty simple. We plant these species all over the place. There's seed sources everywhere. There, there's probably very few places in Saskatchewan, um, south of Prince Albert, that are more than three or four kilometers from the seed source at this point. But it's just, it, they're, they're everywhere. Um, they're very useful when they're in the hay field they're supposed to be in, or in the lawn they're supposed to be in. The problem is, they tend to get out and they produce seed quite prolifically. The seed travels through the air on animals, and then it generally will start germinating in small disturbances. So think of gopher mound, think of you know, a cow's kind of pot up a little bit of um, bare ground. Those are gonna be the places that are initially gonna seed it. And then they spread. Um, and they, they, so they spread by rhizomes, these are underground stems. If you've ever tried to deal with quackgrass, 
You'll be familiar with those big, long, white underground stems. That's a rhizome. So both brome and bluegrass have them, and they spread really aggressively by them. And basically, they aggressively start growing. They produce a lot of above ground growth that starts suppressing everything else. A lot of my research has been basically what happens at this point. Because it's very rare for a species to proliferate into a system, reach high abundance, and then stay there. So usually if a species goes into an outbreak, something comes along to knock it back. Whether it's a pest, a disease, a predator, something comes along basically to take advantage of that overabundant species. So it's kind of unusual ecologically that we would have a species that would come in, take over, and then remain dominant. So, so that, that's my research. A lot of my research has been like, okay, why has this been happening that way? So, a few basic things. These are all. This is all data we've um, collected on, under various projects. So, these species they produce more above ground growth and more litter, that's dead plant material, than native species do. All we're looking at here, these are a series of plots down um, just south of Mercury in uh, Saskatchewan, and they're ranked by the percent cover of brome in them, so these ones over here basically were a monoculture. These ones down here were places where there was no smooth brome present. And so you can see that as we, um, as the brome cover increases, as the plant biomass present increases, obviously this is great if this is your hay field. You, know, you want more productivity in your hay field. But it also turns over into this extra litter in the native grassland. So the extra litter builds up and then we start seeing the real problems. So this is native plant diversity, again, across this same gradient of invasion. And you can see that in a quarter square meter, so we're typically finding 12 or so species in an intact native grassland. By the time we're up to almost 100% brome, the average species richness has dropped to about 10, and in some cases, there's nothing but the brome left. So, so we're seeing a severe decline in native diversity. Over here, this measure of evenness is the measure of how the dominant species are. Basically, as this number goes down, it's telling us that we just have one plant that's super abundant, everything else is really rare. So over here, Yes, we still have 10 species present in these plots, but on average, those species are present in really low abundance. So there might be one or two little sprigs instead of a, a, a robust plant. And so we could predict from this, wait another few years here, a lot of these species are probably gonna be gone from this spot. So this is, so this is the problem. Kentucky bluegrass, I could put up exactly the same slide, it would be exactly the same, exactly the same thing. But here's where it gets really, really interesting, is these effects that this species, this plant species is having carry through into the soil in ways that we had, we, we did not expect at all. And so in this case, what we're looking at here uh, is a study where we're looking at the soil bacteria underneath smooth brome and in places, native ecosystem, that would be places where it was all native grasses. And we see this fascinating pattern where when the smooth brome comes in, it selectively suppresses the dominant bacteria in the soil. So think about that for a moment. It's a plant that's sitting there, just putting its roots into the ground, and yet it is selectively eliminating certain bacterial species from the soil. 
okay? Like that's, when we saw this result, we didn't quite believe that that's what we had just seen. Because it just doesn't seem to make sense that you could have a big plant having that fine of control on a, on, on some bacteria in the soil. Yet that's what they do. And so this, this effect like this carries through into profound changes within the soil ecosystem. Might be having enough trouble again here. Um, and the next slide here will be we're showing that not only does this change carry through the soil bacteria, it, change, it carries through the soil fungi, it carries through the soil archaea. The soil archaea are organisms that are about the same size of bacteria, single-celled organisms, but they are as evolutionary distinct from bacteria as we are from fungi. So, um, so, so, so remarkably different groups, they are all affected by this plant coming in. So we're having these profound ecosystem changes happening, which is a net result do things like speed up nitrogen cycling. So under the under the smooth mode, <coughs> nitrogen is cycling faster. So decomposition is happening faster than it does in the native ecosystem. And what we think is happening is that the brome is basically jump-starting the parts of the soil system that cycle nitrogen because it is a really aggressive collector of nitrogen. So when there's available nitrogen in the soil, brome is much more effective at grabbing it than most native species. That's partly a secret for growing really fast and big. And so what we think is happening is the brome is jump-starting that process and it's maintaining its dominance by feeding the nitrogen through fast and then picking it up again, translating into new growth, back into a positive feedback. So, so we're getting this positive feedback happening that effectively allows the species to maintain its dominance. So we were pretty, pretty excited about all, all of this. Um, this was also about six years of work based on a single field site. So we collected about 60 plots. My, my master's student, Candace Piper, had collected these plots. We ended up getting nine papers out of that data set, which is enormous. That's, that's the most productive data set I've ever been involved in producing. So we're then asking, like, OK, that's one spot, one species. How does? How does this happen in other places uh, or other sites and with other invasive species like Kentucky bluegrass? So we moved to a new study site. This is one. Um, uh, have any of you here had a chance to go for a walk on Kernan Prairie? I'm, okay. Yeah. So I've led occasional tours out there. So this is a site. It's, it's within the. Um, city of Saskatoon city limits now, um, and it's a, a half section of um, native um, native fescue grassland that the university owns for owns for research purposes. So yeah, so here's the, the very complex um, soil processes happening. Um, don't worry too much about the complexity of the diagram. We um, had to, uh, Steve Mann, the postdoc who was involved in this, was a statistical wizard, and it took him months to get to the point where we thought we had a, ha a handle on things. Um, the, the, the net result of all of this complexity, though, is this jump-starting of, uh, of the soil metric cycle. Um, but, yeah. 
took a little bit of work to get there. Um, so yeah, so now we're asking, basically, does this scale up to other invasive species? Because we know Kentucky bluegrass, it does kind of the same thing. Like it grows more aggressively, it puts more litter down. Um, so we worked at um, Kernan Prairie. Uh, for those of you who might know the site, you'll recognize that this is an old picture because we currently have um, houses all along right here now. So lots, lots, lots of excitement when I'm um, planning prescribed fires. I've got houses 400 meters from, from me. Um, but it is, it, it, is a, it is a gym, as a conservation site, and, and as, as, a, as a laboratory. So what we did there, we've got all sorts of invasive species there, because we're in, in an agricultural matrix, we're right next to the town, so we have all sorts of invasive species problems at Kernan Prairie. We've got smooth brome, we've got Canada thistle, sorry, creeping thistle, we have Kentucky bluegrass, we have perennial south thistle, we have a bunch of other ones. So this was a great test case for understanding the role of multiple invasions. And secondly, to scale this up to the value of the ecosystem. So in this work, we're measuring ecosystem services. These are things that are of value to us as humans that ecosystems produce. So these are things like forage production, soil conservation, water purification, climate regulation, i.e. storing carbon in the soil, um, nutrient cycling. Basically, these are all things that ultimately are of some use to us in society. Um, so, it is, so it's one way of measuring what an ecosystem does. And we measure it all through the years. So with just one example here, this is um, an example of the ability of the soil to um, degrade, uh, degrade blood phosphate or Roundup um, in, um, over the years. So it's, you know, that's a compound that is readily degraded biologically, um, but we would probably hope it would get degraded fairly quickly and effectively. So that would be a um, basically a water purification kind of ecosystem service. And so we measured about 50 of these ecosystem services. And overall, we found that, interestingly, the invasion wasn't having that much of an effect. So we found that invasion would positively influence forage production. Basically, that's available food for cows. Um, probably no surprise, given that our two main invasors our favorite food of cows. Um, it was negative for soil conservation, so the invasion tended to um, reduce some of the soil quality indicators. And then it was basically neutral for things like water purification, soil carbon storage, nutrient cycling, things like that. So really there wasn't that much of an effect um, happening here. It was kind of, uh, kind of interesting. But we then, and okay, well, what does this, um, taking that piece with the ecosystem services, putting it back together with another analysis of what's happening in the soil. So I haven't shown you the data here, but behind the scenes we did demonstrate that the same processes that we first observed, that jump starting of cycling and other and cycling and other things that's happening here as well so that's a general thing across sites we can be confident that it it happened but we then started thinking about this invasion as a positive feedback where um, it's altering um, oops sorry um, it's altering these soil communities in ways that are feeding back. So we're confident that this is happening now, that it is this soil feedback that what is what promotes the invasion. And then we're starting to think, well, how do we disrupt this? 
because obviously we probably prefer not to have these invasive species spread around. And the only place we can think of that we can intervene in this system is by preventing shoot biomass and litter accumulation from occurring. So you can imagine that from a management perspective, there's nothing we can do about the soil biology. It's responding to the plants that are present and the animals that are present, but there's nothing we could do as a management intervention that might change those, those processes directly. I mean, we can't reach into the soil and target bacterium X and pull it out of the system. So we have to target something that's above ground that we can actively get at. And the only thing we can identify in this is that shoot biomass accumulation. That seems to be the one place in this cycle that a conservation area manager could step in and try and uh, change, um, change things. So, taking it at that, what does this mean for conservation? So, it's clear that these species have really serious impacts on grassland biodiversity. So, if we care about grassland biodiversity, we need to be caring about these species. If we are primarily caring about the ecosystem services, the issue isn't quite so urgent because, as I showed you, in general, whether these species are present or not, most of the primary underlying ecosystem processes are going to be continuing okay. So, so these sites aren't going to turn into deserts. They're not going to, um, you know, become, you know, toxic for wildlife or any, anything like that. But they are going to be heavily degraded in terms of that, those biodiversity and conservation values. So I think that's where we need to, that's where we need to focus if we're trying to recover things in these systems is what can we do to build back the native uh, biodiversity. And ultimately we need um, management strategies that are gonna limit the spread and dominance of these species. So we need to be able to jump in and keep them keep them under, under control in some way. We're not going to be able to remove them. That's the reality at this point, is these species are so widespread that we're not going to be able to eradicate them from any systems. But we may be able to manage them to the point where they're less of a problem. So ultimately, what this comes down to is an appropriate disturbance regime because when we are managing a grassland ecosystem, the things that remove biomass, we can call them disturbances, um, and basically there's two of them that are critical in grassland. So number one, we need a grazer. So sites that have um, grassland sites need grazers on them. So this means, and, and they need large grazers on them. So, so this means things like our, you know, our Miwasan Valley or, um, authority areas. We need to become used to encountering and living with grazers on those sites. MVA does a great job with the sheep grazing. I would argue they need these guys out there too. Uh, you know, that's a challenge. That's a challenging proposition when you've got people walking their dogs and you've got, um, you know, people wanting to go out and you know enjoy the pristine grassland and things like that. They may not be comfortable with a cow walking up to them, but those are the things. Those are some of the things we need to do to keep these sites. Um, Keep, the, uh, keep these sites intact. Um, second thing is, we need more of this. We need more fires on the landscape. 
And um, fires in the landscape are really critical because they, they not only remove biomass, they remove the accumulated litter. So the cows, they prevent biomass from becoming litter. You know, they eat it before it dies. So they prevent biomass from becoming litter, but it's only fire that's actually going to remove accumulated litter. So we need to become more accepting of the use of fire as a management tool in, um, in grasslands. And an example of this working is uh, this is a research project that was conducted uh, with support of the Saskatchewan Provincial Parks in Douglas Provincial Park. And specifically at this site, we were targeting Kentucky bluegrass. And we know that Kentucky bluegrass greens up a few days earlier than most native grasses. We also know that cows really like um, Kentucky bluegrass. So the thought is we might be vulnerable to a combination of early spring fire and early spring grazing. So early spring grazing is not a normal practice in native grasslands in Saskatchewan. Uh, you know, I've tried to promote um, more certain research studies like this on um, lands that are being used for commercial um, commercial ranch land, and they have been kind of told go away um, because you're just going to ruin the grassland by grazing it early in the spring. Um, but if we want to conduct uh, target Kentucky bluegrass, that's what we need to do. It wor worked really well for parks at this site because this was a site where um, there's a lot of visitor activity later in the summer. We didn't really want cows at this site in July, August, but apparently nobody wants to go there in late May, so we, you, know, you can put the cows out, no, no, no problem. Um, and then the uh, South Parks did this uh, bigger fire. Um, but a, but a 60 hectare prescribed fire, which uh, is on the big end for Saskatchewan. Uh, and what did we find? Well, after five years, we had con persistent control of Kentucky bluegrass by both interventions. Basically, what we're looking at here is just the average Kentucky bluegrass abundance in grazed and burned plots, burned but not grazed, grazed but not burned, and neither burning or grazing. And so you can see, so this was a single fire followed by three years of um, early spring grazing. And you can see how we've basically cut the um, bluegrass abundance about in half. So, so this would be a real, a, real, a real win because we've cut the bluegrass abundance and we've got a lot of recovery of native grasses in here. So particularly the native needle grasses, we're doing really, really well at this site by five years out. So, so this is the kind of intervention that can work. Um, the challenge is doing, um, is doing it. I've, I've talked about, a little bit about challenges of grazing in a um, urban or semi-urban environment. Um, we, uh, you know, we can we can manage. We seem to be able to manage that now with, you know, some some with some grazing in these areas. Uh, oops. But we also need an increased use of prescribed fire in both rural and urban settings, and this is something that sometimes <coughs> people backs up. Like, what are you doing? lighting things on fire, um, but the reality is it's what we have to do if we're going to successfully manage these, manage these systems. So I'd just like to finish off by kind of a call out to an um, organization based in Saskatoon that I'm heavily involved in that is working particularly on the prescribed fire side to, um, to be able to do this. It's called the Canadian Prairies Prescribed Fire Exchange. Um, 
And the goal here is for promoting the safe use of fire as a grassland management tool. So how many of you noticed a lot of smoke plumes about last October, it was the third week in October? You know, you might have seen some big, big ones coming off the Northeast Swale and other places. Um, so those were all prescribed fires that were being um, done by members of this organization as part of a training exercise. So we had gotten, and there's going to be another one the week of October 20th, there's going to be another one happening, so weather permitting, you're going to see these smoke plumes again. And what's happening here is we're, from my perspective, we're working on the fire science, so studying the effects of fire, calibrating our fire prescriptions so that the fires are doing what we, uh, what we want. Um, so I work very heavily with a wide range of organizations that use prescribed fire to basically on the science side of it. And, and the, the, um, the example I just showed you from Douglas Provincial Park is an example of that work where we think it's going to work, but we probably want to verify that it's going to work. Um, and then secondly is training people in how to do um, how to do prescribed fire. So these training exercises we do, we get trainers from the states. Uh, they come from the two we're getting this year from uh, Iowa and Nebraska. So these are individuals who've got 30 plus years of prescribed fire experience. We have conservation agencies like uh, Nature Conservancy and other ones on um, the U.S. Great Plains. So these are people who are used to rocking up with crews and doing, doing thousand hectare prescribed fires. And so, so they've been coming up and working, working with um, those of us in Saskatchewan who we're generally pretty small organizations. So, when I do prescribed fire, I'm generally doing it with one engine and five people. So small crews, maybe two hectares at a time. I don't know a thousand hectares at a time. Um, New Austin Valley Authority does a little bit more than that, but we're all basically um, people who have another job who do prescribed fire um, as, as part of our conservation work. Um, and so a big, a big part of what we're doing is delivering this practical fire training so that we can deliver safe fire. And that's what you, um, if you saw the ones um, in the Northeast Swale last year, we're working four to 500 meters away from people's houses, but we've learned how to Number one, keep the fire where it's supposed to be. And number two, send the smoke up into the sky and not into your not into your backyard. So so we've got um, so we're, we're basically we're learning the techniques to both safely and effectively do fire um, on that on that urban on that urban interface. And I don't know who here was out in the Northeast Swale this spring. Do you, do you know you notice all the crocuses out there this year? No. There's no accident that there's more crocuses on the northeast soil this year than there have been in a long time. Because and they were mostly in the area in the areas that have been, have been burned. So that's that's just an example of the um, effect of the sites. We get great support from the Saskatoon Fire Department, so I would they're, they're, they're awesome. Like they, um, they have switched in the last five years from being, ooh, uh, yeah, I don't know, no, no, I know about you guys, to sending their people on our training courses with us. Um, and I think, it's, I think the reason is, is the fire chief has realized that, you know, a cool October morning is probably a better time to have a fire happening than a hot, windy August evening. So, so, so they understand that just from an infrastructure perspective, protection perspective, this, you know, this works. And so they're, so they're starting to support us with both sending the people and equipment. 
Um, but one of the critical things with this and why, why I'm talking about this here is we also need the public to understand what's going on. And we've noticed again in the last three or four years when we monitor social media on burn days that the discourse has changed quite a bit. So there's quite a few people out there now you know, somebody will pop up on Facebook or Reddit, or, you know, Northeast Swale's on fire, oh my gosh. And somebody else will pop in and, you know, maybe with a link to like the Mawson fire page or something, it's like, hey, didn't you know that was, that was planned? You know, here's why they're doing it. And we are not engineering that at all. <laughs> That's people who've learned are, are, are doing this. So, so I would hope if you if you if we do have good weather in October and you see those smoke plumes that you know that's process conservation and action happening there. So um, so that is um, kind of a, I guess a little bit of a nutshell about some of these grasses and how we um, how we can manage them. So I'd really like to thank you all for coming out um, and um, oh and I guess oh if you want. Know more about the fire exchange, grasslandfire.ca is the website. Um, so, yes, thank you very much.